Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to Apostolic Faith Church Online, Facebook Live. Hallelujah. God bless you. Glad you're here today. God bless you all again, who I've already said. I'm glad you're here. I'm still glad you're here. Amen. And uh, glad the Lord is here. Amen. Amen. God is faithful to us. Amen. I was a little concerned that I would have forgotten how to sing, but I had no doubt in my mind that Brother Juwan was not going to forget how to play <laughs> the piano, as some folks call it. And, uh, so we sent, we thank the Lord for that yes. and appreciate God's goodness to us. Brother Josh, amazing bass again. Yes. As always. Um, so we thank the Lord. Pastor, we miss you today. We're praying for yes. you. Hope you're feeling better. We look forward to seeing you again real soon. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We turn to the scriptures today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. The Apostle Paul says, Know ye not, um, we would say, don't you know, it's, it's funny how languages are and vocabulary. Um, the other day, uh, someone made the statement of me that uh, he's sitting there with his head wrapped around a blanket, um, <laughs> which is kind of the Greek translation. They, they kind of put uh, verbs and, and nouns in a different word yes. order, and so sometimes scripture is that way. Know ye not, don't you know? Do you have your head wrapped around a Bible this morning? Know Amen. ye not that they which run in a race, run all. So before, don't get upset, I'm not going to preach about physical fitness today. I'm not talking about Amen. running. So, for those who find adversity in even that thought, fear not. Fear not. I bring you good tidings of Scripture. Um, everybody runs that's in the race, but only one, one receiveth the prize. Amen. So run ye that you may obtain. There is only one Yes. That comes in first. Yes. Amen. There are still. Yes. You can't count it any other no, way. The no, first no. one is the one who wins. That's right. The winner is the one who comes in first. Yeah. In a race. Yes. Yeah. There's no other point to having a race. Right. Mm -hmm. If third place is the winner, what's the point? <laughs> so. Run ye that you may obtain. Mm -hmm. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate. That means he has self-control, which is a great thing. Yes. Yes. Temperate in all things. Now they do it, these guys who run in a race, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That corruptible crown they were talking about was like a bunch of, uh, a wreath of olive branches woven together. I mean, how cool would that be? Right. To win a race yes. and get to wear a wreath on your head of olive branches. Yes. Those people... But Paul said there's something even better. Yes. They run to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Amen. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. He said, I don't go about my life in a haphazard way. Right. Amen. But I keep under my body. In other words, he's saying, I keep this flesh in subjection mm -hmm. because the race the real race the race for you is not the race against your spouse or the race against your neighbor or the race against um, someone else in particular or individual mm -hmm. but the race that that's important that we win is the race between our flesh yes. and our spirit yeah. and I promise you only one will come in first right. mm -hmm. but it's very important which one does yeah. It makes all the difference, not all the difference in the world, it makes all the difference in eternity. Yeah. He said, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, yes. I myself should be a castaway. Yes. He said, I don't want to have done all of this and then lose out in the end. Yeah. He said, I want to finish well. Yeah. I want to finish well. I want to finish well. Amen. 
That's what I'm here to preach to us today. I want to finish well. Jesus, help us this morning in these next few moments. Lord, touch our hearts. Speak to our minds. God, help me today. Lord, to be an effective preacher. Use me, God, this morning in this house. Lord, minister to all those watching today who will watch sometime later or listen and hear. Lord, bless your church today, God. Help us this morning. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for this day. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated this morning. She just wouldn't let up. Every day she asked him again and again. And then she asked him some more. And then the next day she would ask him again. And when he started to fall asleep, she would shake him awake and say, Hey, why won't you tell me? If you really loved me, you would tell me. The daily drama was persistent. It was day after day, the same question over and over again. She just couldn't. She wouldn't. She, she wouldn't leave it alone. All he wanted was a few moments of peace. But every waking moment she was there asking him again and again. She laid the guilt on him. If you really loved me, you would tell me. Aren't I pretty enough? Why don't you tell me? Didn't I cook enough good dinners for you? Why don't you tell me? Didn't, don't, don't, don't you love me? How can you say you love me, but you won't tell me the truth? And on and on and on and on and on and on. What did the wise man say? It's better to dwell in the wilderness or on the housetop than with a feuding, brawling woman. It's, it, was, it was not the place to be. Until his soul, the scripture says, was vexed unto death. And finally Samson succumbed to the ceaseless onslaught and told Delilah his secret. He said, if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me. It wasn't long after that that Samson would be found a blind man. Eyes gouged out by the hands of his enemies. Enduring the daily grind of life in captivity at a Philistine mill. His life hadn't started out that way. His life hadn't been intended to take that direction. He was born as a child of promise with the greatest intentions of God upon him. Sam, Samson was a promised child and he was born for a promised purpose. He was to be a leader of Israel. He had for a time lived in the immeasurable strength of a holy life and seen abundant victory over his enemies. No other man had strength like Samson had strength. His enemies found it impossible to beat him. They just could not. They tried to gang up on him, and it didn't work. They tried to sneak up on him, and it didn't work. They devised all manner of ways to beat this man, Samson, but they could not do it because he was strong and strengthened by his holiness in relationship with God. But now things had changed. Samson had chosen a path that led him astray. A path that led to a compromised life, having entered into marriage covenant with a woman named Delilah, who was a daughter of the enemy. Now, this man who was born with the greatest intentions of God to be a deliverer of Israel, found himself blindly living out his last days before the constantly mocking voice of his enemy. A sad ending, for sure, to say the least, for our friend Samson. And then one day, the Philistines held a celebration. They had a big party, a gathering, a get-together. There were thousands of men and women there. and They brought Samson into the building to make sport of him. They put him on display as a trophy, like you would if you shot a ten-point buck or a large six-by-six six elk or some other great thing. Hallelujah. Get a sidetrack. Hallelujah. They put him on display as a trophy and, and had him standing there with a the young man holding him. And finally, in these fading moments of his life, Samson reached out with a last request to a lad that stood by. He said, let me fill the pillars of this house. 
And with the last request to God, he said, let me feel your power one more time. Amen. To the boy, he said, let me feel the pillars. To God, he said, let me feel your power Amen. one more time. And the race of Samson's life came to an incredible finish. Even though it looked like and indeed he had stumbled and fallen, his finish was far better than the last few years of his life or whatever that period of time was. In his last end, he experienced the greatest victory of his life as he brought the house down with the power of God working through him. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. I would not stand in this pulpit today and encourage anyone to follow the full example of Samson's life, but I would encourage you to recognize that his best moments were his last moments. That even at his lowest, we can look back and say, Samson, even on your worst day, there are better things to come. Even in your worst moment, in the depths of your deepest failure, there's better days ahead for you. You may have fallen. Your, your purpose in God, you may have sidestepped. But friend, there is still power for you to finish well. He found in himself a willingness to repent from his blinding failures and sin. And he found a place of repentance and trusted once again in the power that he knew did not come from himself. Amen. Samson finished well. He didn't live well all the time, but he finished well. Yes, amen. And more than anything else, it matters that we finish yes. well. Right. Amen. If we're going to finish well, we need to run intentionally to gain the prize, to obtain the prize, to reach the prize. That word prize in 1 Corinthians 9 is only used in two places in the New Testament. It's used there as we read this morning, and then also again Paul uses it in Philippians chapter 3. There is no other place that a prize like this is, is mentioned or described other than when Paul says, I press toward the mark of the prize, and that prize is the high calling or the upward calling of Jesus Christ. He said in in other words, the, the only prize in our dispensation that's worth running for is the prize of our eternity with Jesus. It's time to realign and refocus our eyes, our hearts, our minds on what the prize truly is and be as intentional about reaching that as we are about reaching any other goal in our life. More than we're excited about paying off our car or paying or some other trophy that we could attain, our eyes should first and foremost be fixed on the prize. Amen. That is the end of this world. It is a race that we run intentionally. It's not something that we can accidentally do, this living for God thing. I'm sure I've said it before, but it's so profound. I think it was Brother Libby whom I first heard say it, but it, nobody ever front slides. <laughs> you, you don't just accidentally get ahead. In, you, don't, you don't sit around in your home and just wake up one morning and fall off the couch into an apostolic altar. Altar. <laughs> it takes some effort. Right. To roll out of bed and to to uh, to feed the dog and to get the kids ready and to start the car and to put air in the tires that have gone flat overnight and to add oil to the engine that somebody left out and to, to scrape the ice and push the snow and, and climb the mountain or whatever it may be to drive behind that driver who insists on going the speed limit until you get to the house of the Lord. It doesn't happen accidentally. Amen. Amen. We're not holy by accident. It takes some effort. We're not holy by looking around at the world and just, just blending in and being like everybody else. We're holy when we make something intentional in our life. Yes. Samson had strength because he lived differently Amen. than all of his peers, all of his Amen. friends. And it affected the way that he looked. Bless your name. It's an intentional and ongoing, and I might say ever-increasing effort to get to where Jesus wants us to be. Yeah. 
There's doctrines of church history that teach the idea of the perseverance of the saints, which is better known as the concept in the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Those who believe that you come and make a confession of your faith, that you believe in Jesus as your personal Savior, and from that point on, you are forever saved and you can't lose your salvation. It's a very interesting concept because you have no part in it. Because those, the, the, the perseverance of the saints also goes along with the doctrine of predis, predestination. that says God chooses who is saved and nobody has, nobody has any decision to make. Because if anything that you did brought about salvation, then it would be salvation by works. And they reject that. So it doesn't matter what you do, who you are, where you go. If God has chosen you, then you're saved. If God hasn't chosen you, then you can't be saved. It's just... And what's even worse is you don't really know where you stand until you die. Amen. Because they say, if you ask them, well, if someone then is saved and then they, 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 they commit some terrible sin, um, how does that work? And mostly the answer is, well, then that means they were never really saved to begin with. It just looked like they were, but really they weren't. That's a very confusing and difficult life yes. and difficult place for, at least in my mind, very difficult way to pursue a walk with God and pursue faith. It's all, it's all up to God. Nothing's up to me. doesn't matter what I do or how I respond or how I act, which obviously all of this is non-biblical. It's extra biblical and through church history, it's, it's been taught. I do agree with this, as Jesus said. No one can take your salvation from you. Yes. Right. There is no one that has power over you. Not even the devil can take you out of the yes. hand of Jesus. If yes. you place yourself there, however, I do most certainly believe that it requires some effort on our part. You are yes. not going to heaven by accident. Yes. It's not that you work for it to deserve it, but we do need to respond to God. People on, in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, they said, Apostles, Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? They understood there had to be a response. If God was going to do something in their life, they had to reach out Amen. to Him. Friend of mine, it is truly a race. It's a race against our flesh that wants to destroy us, and it's up to us to run yes. toward Him right. every day. Amen. Yes. The concept of salvation is one that continues and it's one that is not simply a moment in time. Amen. We can look at our relationship and our experience with God and say that there was a moment when I was saved. I was born again of the water and the Spirit. I was baptized after I had repented. I was filled with the Holy Ghost. I spoke in other tongues and I can celebrate today that I was saved. But we should also have the concept that today I am still being saved. Amen. The work of sanctification, the work of God changing and growing in me and making me holy and making me more like Him. If I had been perfect at that altar where I repented and the day I was baptized and once I spoke in tongues, that was all there was. That's not the end of the line. Amen. If it was, there would be no need for the gifts of the Spirit. To right. If there was, there would be no reason in Galatians that Paul would write about the fruit of the Spirit. The initial evidence of the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. But the continuing, the continuing evidence of the Holy Ghost is the fruit of the Spirit in our life. It's love and joy and peace and long-suffering and temperance and meekness and patience. It's not... Simply whether we've spoken in other tongues, though that is critical, pivotal, and essential, there is more. We are saved past tense. We are being saved present tense. And we are looking forward to the day when we will ultimately be saved in a future and eternal sense. Realistically, none of us can look around right now and say, I am completely and fully saved because we're not on that side of it yet. We're still here. I still need Jesus to work in me. I still need to grow from faith to faith. I still look forward to the day whether I'm under the ground and am brought up out of the grave or whether I am standing somewhere on the the surface and I hear the trump of God. Friend, I am looking for the day when I rise from this place to go and meet my Savior in the air. Friend, it is the valid and essential church. It is the valid and essential hope of the
the church of every age. We should have a constant and continuing hope of the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord today. I want to finish well. I want to finish well. I want to finish well. Galatians chapter 3, Paul asks the question, No foolish Galatians, how can it be? You who have begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He said you need to keep walking, you need to keep running, you need to keep pursuing. It's not something where you go to the starting line, you hear them fire the shot, and then you sit down. Yeah. say, well, I'm at the finish line, why go any further? <laughs> Some folks kind of have that mentality. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. You're not moving beyond this point. I've done good, and I don't need to do any gooder. <laughs> Interestingly, Henry Ford was much that way. Um, Henry Ford, I'm serious. Henry Ford, he's not in the Bible, but he's a good man. <laughs> Henry Ford was very influential in the founding of the modern age of manufacturing assembly lines yeah. putting things together building things making it happen really his his work and the efforts of the men that worked with him are, are really what made the united states successful yes. in world yes. war ii yeah um, but henry ford worked for a very long time to develop an internal combustion gas engine and figure out spark plugs and all that kind of stuff he figured out um him and other engineers with him figured out how to make make an engine block that wasn't just cylinders bolted together he yes. figured out how to make a block out of cast iron and yes. put a head and a head gasket on. Henry Ford figured that out. Yes. He put that four-cylinder engine in his Model T Ford, which sold over 15 million Model Ts. Amen. Brother Mark may have had one. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Um, the Model T was his, his most famous and most successful invention, and he sold the Model T year after year. But after he had the Model T, he felt like he had perfected yes. the process of car making. Yes. And so he would not allow any changes. Uh -uh. Nope. He, wouldn't, he wouldn't let them, when, when they made advances with electricity, he figured out how to use an alternator instead of a magneto. If you don't know what that is, ask Brother Chris, he'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but he wouldn't let them, he wouldn't let them nope. update. Nope. That's right. He went away on vacation. His son and some other engineers there at the plant, while he was gone, they put together a prototype of what a new Model T Ford could look like and kind of streamline things, made it look a little better, improve things. He came back from vacation. They had it sitting there in the plant in front of his office. He walks up to it, opens the door. He rips off all four doors. He climbs inside on the seats like a little kid, starts kicking, kicks the roof off of it, tears the seats apart. He looks at his son and these other guys and says, don't you ever do that again. The Model T is mine, and it is not going to change. I have made it work, and so I have made it perfect, and therefore there is no reason to change it. And some people feel that way about themselves. <laughs> some people feel that way about themselves. I have come out of some things. I have come to God. I am what I am. I've, I've spoken in tongues at an altar. I've been baptized in Jesus' name under water. I repented once of a sin that I almost remembered. And now I am perfected and I am ready for glory. Don't anybody preach to me. Don't anybody ask me to pray. Don't talk about repentance to me. Because this model is the model that's going to make it all the way. It's that attitude that's why Chevrolet has vehicles on the road yes, today. That's right. And Dodge, too. Oh, yeah. The Dodge brothers worked for Henry Ford. Yes, they did. Hallelujah. Yeah. Going to be a revival in the church. Yeah. About they had ideas and they left. <laughs> he said, How can you begin in the spirit and now think you're made perfect by the flesh? How do you how can you come to the understanding you have you needed Jesus to get right and now you think you can stay right by yourself that you needed Jesus to bring you out but now that you're out you can find your own way friend of mine that's crazy you better get back to an altar we need to pray we need to seek the Lord we need to finish 
well. We ought to finish better than when we started. We ought to close this thing better than when we opened it. We've not been called to stay stagnant in the house of the Lord. We've been called to grow, to run, to move, to live. He said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. He didn't say you're going to look like a stagnant pond with algae growing on you. That's revolting, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Jesus said, in regards to the road, the road that you're racing on is straight. Yes. And it's narrow. In other words, it is possible for you to look ahead. Because the road Jesus wants us on is straight. He's not going to throw you a curve. There may be curves coming through life. But let me preach it that way this morning. Could you just say amen? amen? Jesus isn't going to throw you a curve in the road of life. He it's straight and narrow. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So keep looking ahead and forget what's behind, Paul said. Yes. Yeah. Forget about that back there. Yes. If you get in a tight spot, you're probably in the right place. <laughs> Amen. Years ago in Oklahoma, I forget what county it was in, but I was in a combine. It was a red combine. A good combine. Um, and this combine was about 13 feet and 8 inches wide. Amen. The outside of the tires... And I was traveling down the road with two other combines, and we came to a bridge that was about 13 feet, 9 inches wide. Combine 13 feet, 8 inches, bridge 13 feet, 9 inches, if we're being generous. In other words, it's just it was just wide enough to get through. It was a long way. It was just right. It was a long way around to avoid this bridge, and so the boss said. The boss said, we've come this way before. The combine's the same. The bridge is the same. We've gotten through before. So you ought to be able to get through it now. He said, don't sit in the cab and try and lean out over the side and see the edge of the tire. So you're going to run into the bridge and get stuck and break things. And he didn't want that. So he said, just look straight ahead. Amen. Line up the center Amen. and look straight ahead. Yes. You'll get through. Amen. It will fit. Amen. You'll get across. Amen. We've done it before. Amen. You can do it again. Amen. You'll get to the other side. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. If you want to finish well, just start looking straight ahead. Because, friend, this road, we've been down before. God is not surprised. He's brought us over before. And He'll bring us through it again. You can clap your hands. Rejoice in the Lord. Knowing that the race you're on is going somewhere. And you're closer now than when you first began. Hallelujah. It simply requires a patient pursuit. A patient pursuit. Uh -huh. A patient pursuit. Amen. There's a group of people in Afghanistan who've been waiting patiently for 20 years to retake control of that country. Yes. And they have. Now, I'm not, uh, please, please don't start thinking about that too much. I don't want to sidetrack everybody's attention this morning. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not here to uh, try to give voice to my political opinions and all that. All I'm saying is the Taliban were there for 20 years yes, and they were amazing. waiting for their chance. They were waiting amid bombings from the most powerful military force yes. on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. They were a relatively small group of people set on by the United States. I don't know if you remember 2001, but when I was in college, like everybody's, I mean, it's kind of blue-collar stuff that I went to college for, so it was like mechanics and 
Forestry people and stuff, but the word around the campus was, let's go make that place a parking lot. There's some kind of fascination Americans have with parking, and they wanted a parking lot here, and they, and they really tried hard to do it, like with, with high explosives and great bombs and all of that, and that's what this group of, of Taliban folks was facing. Now, me, I, I don't know, I can't imagine staying through that. I certainly can't imagine spending 20 years trying to overcome that. But they did. Yes. They faced loss. They faced impossibility. They faced the most powerful nation in the world trying to stop them from what they wanted to accomplish. And yet, within just a, a very short time, they are able to come out of hiding and, and yes. stand in a place of power. Now, I am certainly not giving them credit for anything. Please don't feel like Brother Frankfurt is going on to... to Thank God for the Taliban. That's not what I mean. <laughs> I simply mean they were there waiting for the moment when the door of opportunity opened. And when it did, they did not miss a beat. They didn't complain about how they had been treated. They didn't even, they don't even care that I don't like the way they do things. It doesn't bother them. Political pressure and, and people all over the world looking at them saying that what they're doing is horrible. That doesn't bother them. Yeah. I say all that to say this. Would to God the church Amen. would stand up with that kind of attitude and instead of feeling like everything's lost and it's all hopeless and there's too much against us and we're never going to defeat this if we could rather position ourselves that when there is a moment when the door opens, that we would be ready to stand up with all that we have and take back everything that belongs to the church. Friend of mine, revival comes through a patient pursuit. Amen. Through a patient pursuit. Amen. Hallelujah. James 5 and 7 says it this way, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto what? Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. That's Amen. what we're waiting for. That's what we're looking exactly. for. Yes. We're, not, we're not looking for human reform. We're looking yes. for a powerful church. We're yes. looking for revival of people reaching souls. We're looking for churches to be planted, people to be reached, families to be saved. That's, that's what we're looking for as we look unto the coming of the Lord. Amen. Yeah. He says it this way, Behold the husbandman, which is a farmer. Behold the husbandman that waits. Farmers have to wait. Most of their life is spent waiting. The rest of their life is spent hurrying. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's combined when the mechanic is there. They're waiting while he's hurrying. Amen. It's just a revelation that came to me suddenly. Somebody should write that down. The husbandman that waiteth, he waits patiently. Yes. And he does it because he wants to end well. He waits patiently after he plants. He waits patiently for the rain. He waits patiently for growth to take place in a way that he can't possibly comprehend or calculate in his own mind. He waits for it. And when the harvest comes, he wants to position himself so he can finish well. Mark chapter 13, Jesus talked about some of these farmers. and He said, Scripture says, when the blade was sprung up, then appeared the tares also. Um, there was a field a guy had, and he went out and planted his good crop of wheat in it. And there were other fellows that came along, and they scattered weed seeds all through it. Oh. It's a hateful thing to do. Right. They didn't even have Roundup to spray on it. So it's like these seeds were going to come up. Yeah. And they didn't plant things in nice straight rows always, so it was hard to go through with a rototiller on your tractor and, <laughs> and dig it up. So it was like they were just all mixed in. Yes. It was a mess. And so folks came to Jesus and said, shouldn't we go out there and pull them weeds out? Because they're going to mess everything up. Jesus did specifically declare it was the work of the enemy that did that. He pointed that out. Um, it, was, it was the enemy 
But he said, even though it was the enemy, have patience and let both grow together. The, the tares that scripture is referencing to is actually false seeds, is what the Greek word comes out to. So to sum up what Jesus was saying, he's saying this. Don't be outgrown by the false. Right. Just grow. Keep pressing upward. Amen. Keep pressing forward. Yes. Yes. Don't get sidetracked in the middle of your race because there's a cheater running next to you. Don't get sidetracked in the middle of your race because you're true and something else is false. Just keep running the race and you'll finish well. He said, I'll take care of it all in the end. You just you just focus on growing. You focus on doing well. Focus on finishing well. And in the end of it all, I'll sort it all out. God has a way of figuring out what's right and wrong. I don't know if you know that or not, but He does. He doesn't even need Google. Or Snopes. Or whoever else. Find out if people's telling the truth. It's like, it's like He's God. He knows everything. We need to finish well. We need to finish well. We're trying to figure out a way to do that. Finish well. Matthew 20 talks about a man who had a vineyard and harvest time had come and it was time to pick grapes. And they don't didn't give you a very large window of time in which to pick grapes in. They had to be picked pretty close to all points. Or else they go bad on the vine or it wouldn't be right. And... So he goes out in the morning, Scripture says, and he hired as many guys as he could hire. First thing in the morning, he said, I'll pay you a penny if you work all day. And they said, yes! It was like he had he'd gone out weeks before and put up all his cardboard signs along the road, up and down to every intersection. Yes. Now hiring, now hiring, come and work in my vineyard, come. And so some of them came. But not everybody came, not enough people came. So he went back out at like 10 in the morning. He said, anybody else want to work? And a few of them were there. He said, I'll still pay you a penny, just go to work. He went back at lunchtime. Found another group of folks. He said, I'll still pay you a penny. Went back in the middle of the afternoon, found some more. He said, I will still pay you a penny. If you start at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and work till 6 p.m. tonight, I will pay you a penny. They're like, man, that's awesome. Yes. We'll do it. He kept up his enduring investment to the end. Because what mattered to him was, was not the incidental amount that he had to spend to get what he wanted. What mattered to him was finishing well. What mattered to him was a final and complete harvest. And so at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and they shut down at 6, but at 5 o'clock he went out and he looked around and there were people and he said, why are you sitting here all, idle all day? Yes. And he said, well, nobody's hired us. He said, well, you're hired. Uh -huh. I'll give you a penny. Yes. Go pick grapes. Yes. And so they did. And he finished well. Yeah. Now, not everybody was happy about it, obviously. Most some of us are getting an attitude right now. Like, that ain't fair. <laughs> Just like where I work. <laughs> but what mattered to this man was at the end of the day, everything was finished and needed done. What should matter to us as we run our race, as we come to church, as we live for God, is that at the end of the day, everything that matters to him is done. Friend, that ought to be what drives us every day of our life. It's a race worth running, and it's a race worth winning. It's a race worth giving everything to. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we'll find the end of the Lord. Yes. The end of the Lord. The end of the Lord. James said it that way. James 5 and 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Yes. He talks about Job and the prophets. He says, consider Job. He has seen the end of the Lord. And it is grace. Amen. And it's mercy. Thank you, Jesus. The end of the Lord. Yes. We want to say the end of the road. It's not the end of the road when you find the end of the Lord. Right. In other words, God has a finish intended for you. He has a finishing place. Job had a great start to life, but his life became synonymous with suffering. That's what we think about when we think of Job. We don't think about a blessed man. We think about a suffering man. He had seven sons and three daughters. 
I'm not sure if he had seven sons first and then three daughters. He may have had three daughters first. I don't know. Things to wonder about. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 yoke of oxen, 500 yoke of oxen, 500, which is equivalent to 450 tractors. He had 500 donkeys, which is equivalent to somewhere around 300 triaxle dump trucks. Um, he had a lot of stuff. He was a wealthy man. His life was blessed. And then he lost everything. Yes. Like in a short time, he lost everything. Yes. Like without any warning, he lost everything. Yes. Amen. Like without a prophet coming and prophesying to him, you're going to lose everything, and God's going to double everything and give it all back. Yes. He didn't have any. He just lost everything. Yes, he, did. he was praying. He was serving God. He was yes. he was raising his family. He's doing what he should. And all yes. of a sudden, he lost everything. Yep. Amen. Right. No warning. No, no explanation. But this is the deal with Job. He accepted difficulty from God without giving God a deadline Amen. on when he had to fix it. Amen. He accepted difficulty from God and didn't give him any kind of ultimatum. He didn't say, God, if, if you'll just fix my life, then... God, if you, if you don't fix my life, then... He just said, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. Yes, he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And I'm going to see him one day. That's that, friend, his, his, his finish line that he cared about was not wrapped up in his wealth, possessions, or even his family. It was wrapped Amen. up yes. in seeing Amen. his Savior. Thank you, Jesus. He finished well. He finished well. He had difficult days, but he finished well. He finished with another seven sons and three daughters. His possessions were doubled. He lived another 140 years after all of that happened to him. He finished well. And we can finish well too. Let's stand together this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about those who finished well. Even though they fell in their lifetime, they finished well. More than once, Abraham failed God. But he's called the father of the faithful because he finished well. Sarah spent most of her life a barren woman with nothing to show for the efforts of her life most of her life long. But the one soul that she brought into the kingdom of God made all the difference in the world. Amen. Just because your efforts aren't bringing what you think they should. She brought one soul into the kingdom. And it made all the difference. Whatever you want to say about Sarah, you can say she finished well. Yes. Jacob grew up with difficult family dynamics. He became a deceiver and he suffered deception from his uncle. But at the end of the trial of his life, he became Israel, prince. Yes. Power with God. At the end of his days, he left praying. That man finished, that man who was known most of his life as a deceiver, that man who had fallen and failed God. At the end of his days, he finished praying blessing over future generations. He finished well. Moses was born into a culture that wanted to kill him, a culture of corruption. But he finished he finished with the promise before his eyes. Joshua spent much of his early life in the wilderness wandering. But before his race ended, he saw the walls of Jericho fall down. Yes. Samson was born to promise. He lived in compromise, but he finished with power. David, great king of Israel, but also an adulterer and a murderer. But when he finished his race, Scripture would record of him, he was a man after God's heart. No wonder the prophet Michael would write these words, Rejoice not against me, O my enemies, for when I fall, I shall arise. He was saying, you may fall down, but you can still finish well. Yes. Amen. Proverbs says, a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. 
Your fall doesn't have to be fatal. You can still finish well. Your trouble and trial that's been imposed on you by forces outside your control, you can still finish well. Hebrews chapter 12 goes on to tell us these all entered into this great cloud of witnesses that right now is there to encourage us to even now to finish well. Amen. To finish well. Amen. To finish well. Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells the story of a father who had two sons and he invited them both to come to work for him. The first said, I will not go. He said, I don't want to work for you. And his dad said, okay. But scripture said then he repented and he went and worked for his father. The second son approached the situation somewhat differently and he said, father, I'll go. But he went not. One said, no, I won't go. But in the end, he went. The other said, I will go. And in the end, he would not. Only one of them finished well. And it wasn't the one that started out with the best idea. It wasn't the one that started out on the right road. It wasn't the one that started out with the right posture. It was the one who repented. It was the one who changed his mind. It was the one who said, Father, I'll go where you want me to go. I want to finish well. Yes. I want to finish well. This church is going to finish well. Amen. This apostolic church. This apostolic church is going to finish well. Regardless of what the rest of the world does, the church of Jesus' name it's going to finish well. Yes. I don't know how. I don't know by what means other than by the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. We're going to finish well. Amen. So we may as well fix our eyes on that prize and run this race set before us with patience. Get back to the road that is straight and narrow and, and squeeze through the tight places if we have to. And know that at the end of it all, there is a blessing. There is power from God. This race is worth running, my friend. And it's worth winning. It's worth winning. It's worth winning. Amen. So I invite you to an altar place today. I invite you to come and pray. If you're at a place in your race where you need to turn around, it's an altar of repentance for you. If you're in a place in your race where things have slowed down or perhaps you feel like you can or you just don't have the desire to go any further, there's a place at this altar where you can be strengthened and refreshed in the Lord and find inspiration and motivation to move forward. There's a place at this altar for you if you've fallen flat on your face. Your knees have been skinned. Your life has been roughed up a bit. Friend, you can come to this altar today and find wholeness this morning. And friend, I'm telling you, you can finish well. God bless you, Facebook friends. So glad that you joined us today. We're going to come. We're going to seek the Lord in praise. Somebody come to these altars.